Welcome to another episode of Big Dawn and the Ladies of Lavender, also known <laughs> also known as Anks. <laughs> as always, hosted by Donnie Davis and Stephanie Davis. Thank you. This week, very special guest. Special guest alert. Special guest alert. Sable, please say your last name because I just forgot it. No, that's okay. It's Sable McKelvin. 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 Round of applause. Welcome to the show. Welcome. Thank you so much. World renowned therapist in the house. (laughs) Forbes, 40 under 40, right? And I wish. 20 under 20. One day. Well, not that that ship has sailed. Um, (laughs) But the 40, we we got a few years. We got a few years to (laughs) that. Give us a little bit. Introduce yourself. Just give us uh, the essence of Sable. Sure. So name is Sable McKelvin. You can also call me Dr. Sable McKelvin. I am not a doctor. I'm not a doctor in mental health. I am a doctor of health administration. I just finished that up back in May. Thank you. I appreciate it. But I am a licensed clinical social work supervisor. I have been a social worker for over seven years. I have worked in a lot of different places, spreading the joy of mental health care and social justice needs. Um, I've worked in a lot of healthcare facilities, hospitals, nonprofits, anything you can name. In a previous life, I was a teacher. Um, that's really what eventually led me to becoming a social worker. Um, had a had a lot of really uh, troubled students who were going through a lot of different things, and they were just hurting. And I found myself doing a lot more counseling than I was teaching. So if you guys are familiar with maybe 15-ish years ago, counselors were not the same in schools as they are now. Counselors were doing a lot of like career counseling and like, what do you want to be when you grow up? Let's push you out into the world and get you a college degree. I kind of slid into that role a little bit because counselors were not really doing much uh, to support the students at the time. So thankfully, I eventually found my niche and that led me to social work. But I'm really happy with where I am. I'm the clinic director of Ellie Mental Health in Houston in the Tanglewood office, and we are growing and learning, and I'm really looking forward to talking with you guys about anxiety and stress because now's the time of year to do it. (laughs) You are not even kidding. It is often popping right now for, I know myself, but Mm -hmm. probably a lot of other people. So with holidays, families, all of the stress. We were just talking about everything going on in the world right now. There's a lot. There's a lot for everybody to deal with right now. So I, I think we won't have a problem talking about any of those things here today. Not at <laughs> all. Not at all. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. So Ellie Mental Health, we actually had the pleasure of going to visit you ladies at the office. It's a great spot. I'm not super familiar with Houston, but I'll tell you the parking was easy, mm-hmm. which is a plus. Yep. I'll go anywhere. If you tell me the parking's easy, I'll meet you in Houston. Not a big deal. <laughs> and it's Sorry. free. Parking yeah. is free, which free. is also a hot commodity. In yes, yes, it is. <laughs> oh, so it was lovely to meet y'all. I loved the office. Um, great setup. Super easy to access. And I know you guys do virtual as well, right? Yes, we do virtual and in-person visits. Mm-hmm. We definitely have noticed an uptick of people that want to be in person, especially mm-hmm. after the pandemic. But we still, of course, also virtual because some days you just don't feel like getting out of bed or you're kind of a little sicky, but don't want to be in person, but not sick enough to not show up to therapy. So no excuse. You can just log on to your computer. Here's all, another one of my favorite things about you guys. Y'all accept health insurance. Yes. Guys, this is a game changer. I love that. Because the, the therapist that I've been to, they do not accept insurance. And right. It makes it's very limiting to pay out of pocket. What is it? A couple know, hundred bucks. Yeah, three hundred, three fifty. Yeah. But it's so important. So good on you guys for doing that. Mental health is health. I, I yeah. truly believe. I don't want to go on a tangent here because I'm good at it. But I think your mental health absolutely affects your overall health. So let's get that checked first, and then let's do everything else. Blue Cross Blue Shield. They get it, right? Ellie Mental Health gets it. So that's a collaboration. We all need it. I love that so much. I just, feel very strongly. You do. This mental health should be covered under all health insurance. Truly, Ooh, it shouldn't be so hard. Yeah. Maybe we could dive into that sometime. Like, why is it just a pain in the butt for most people to do it? Or is it like 
I just assumed it just wasn't covered. No, you have to file it yourself uh, if you want. Yeah in, some, right. yeah, in some cases, you even have to file it yourself, which is another headache on top of all the other things you have going on. Yeah. But a lot of places are starting to realize the importance of mental health, especially when it comes to mental health in the workplace and how it affects your productivity and all these different things that can happen. Um, so now there, there's really no excuse for a company not having EAP services, which is employee assistance programs, yeah. which is directly connecting you to a therapist to talk about what's going on. And the great thing is most insurance companies, most good insurance companies will have a, a carve out for mental health services. So you could actually pay like a simple copay and you don't have to pay an arm and a leg to, yeah. to get mental health services because it's all connected. Mental health is connected to your physical health. Physical yeah. health is connected to your mental health. It's all related. Yeah, it is. I'm with you. I'm s I don't know why people don't understand that yet. I don't want to go down that path. We have a lovely outline here. Mm -hmm. Donnie did most of the work. I just read it over <laughs> and approved. So we want to make the most of your time. So thank you so much for carving out some time in your day to do this with us. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Happy to be here with you all. So we recognize that you obviously, it's not like you specialize in stress and anxiety, but since that's what the show's about, that's what most of the questions are going to be geared towards. Yeah. And we'll just dive right into it. How do you define stress and anxiety in a clinical setting? So that's a good first question to ask. So I'm glad that we're starting with it first. But stress and anxiety are defined as very distinct but very related psychological experiences and both of them kind of fall under the broader category of mental health disorders so it's important to stress that stress is a broader concept that can be a precursor to anxiety but not all stress leads to anxiety disorders right got it i'm right. tracking got it okay so anxiety disorders, on the other hand, are going to be more persistent, more severe, and those actually require more clinical intervention. So stress is like the physical response that you perceive to a threat or a challenge. It's pretty much the things, the same things that let our ancestors survive bear attacks in the wilderness Yeah, it is the same thing how we deal with someone cutting us off on the road, especially okay. in Houston. Yes. Yeah. So those same those same things happen in our body. You may feel it in your body as like heart palpitations, sweating, those types of things. It's only when that stress manifests as chronic or continuous events that happen when you start to get a little nervous that it could be something more than just stress. So anxiety, on the other hand, that's again that more persistent and intense emotional state. So whenever you have your stress and you're constantly in that heightened awareness, that excessive worry, that fear, that apprehension, maybe you even start to ruminate on certain things. Anything that you perceive as a threat, it could be anything from your kid keeps crying in the back of the car to, you know, something happening at work or not getting along or you have a fear that people don't like you at work. That is just a very clear indication that something else deeper is going on and you likely have anxiety. It's really where it's manifesting in something like the baby's crying in the background and I cannot handle it. It's really probably something else. This is just kind of tipping you off that there's a problem. Yeah, because typically we all have our own triggers. Mm -hmm. And while, yes, it's always annoying when you hear a baby crying, babies are beautiful, but Yes, that's in the car. When they get to <laughs> cry, remember for yeah, us, our daughter hated the car, <laughs> and it would just be yeah. like, "Don't even talk to me. We're not talking to each other. We just need to get home." Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> that'll do it. Exactly. Oh yeah, I think that'll do that for anybody, honestly. <laughs> but it's really that persistent state of if you can handle like baby crying, you got to get home. You got traffic. Somebody just cuts you off. And your physical response is to shut down or scream or yell or do something that is more like a maladaptive type of response as opposed to centering yourself or doing something else to calm your nervous system down. You're, if you're flipping your lid, essentially, that is a clear indication that something else is going on. You probably have all these multiple stressful events, those concurrent stressful events happen every single day maybe even several moments throughout the day 
chances are you probably have something deeper going on with you. Yeah. yeah. It kind of feels like in those moments you are unable to identify that this right now is temporary. Exactly. It's fleeting. And I think we get stuck, my experience, I get stuck in feeling like this is how it is forever. And it's not. Most things are very temporary, fleeting feelings. A baby will stop crying when we get home and you feed her. These are not life-altering things, but that is how it feels in the moment when you have an anxiety disorder. Absolutely. I mean, think yeah. about the times when you, when you have a child that doesn't or can't form the words to express how they're feeling. What do they do? They stomp, they yell, they yeah. cry, they don't articulate. That's kind of what happens to adults or teenagers yeah. or really anybody out of that typical stage where you don't have the language to articulate what's going on in your head. Yeah. That's, we just revert to that typical uh, instinctual type of response to not understanding the world around us or being frustrated with the world around us. Yeah. Again, as opposed to taking a deep breath, realizing that this is temporary what can i do to resolve the situation what can i do to resolve my mood right now yes fix our, our me. <laughs> yeah exactly yeah. our natural response is to kick and scream and yell and punch yeah. and do all those other things yeah in in like i said in bear attacks great it works great perfect for do all the bears things. perfect for the bears but you do not want to do that when you're at work or you're with yeah. your kids because yeah. Your kids are watching everything too. So that's an important yeah. factor as well. You want to make yeah. sure that you're handling things in a certain way that is conducive to supporting your environment, supporting your children's upbringing, all of that good stuff. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. On the topic of like adult tantrums, it kind of reminded me of this thing that I had buried. But like in the first few months of our daughter's life, I can remember being in the car and something very much like a day to day annoyance happened. And I just started punching the seat next to me. You? I probably punched that thing 10 <laughs> times. And I wasn't, it wasn't like pitter patter punches. I was just like, I it went off for a minute. You, yeah. really? And as soon as it was over, I felt embarrassed. And I also felt like, okay, like I need to do something about my day to day. That makes me life. sad. I didn't know yeah. that. Just a flip switch. And that poor seat, I never even apologized to it. Oh, well, I'm sure it forgives you now. It, <laughs> I'm just going through something. <laughs> I sold that truck a long time ago. I sold that truck and it's bad to you. There you go. <laughs> what common misconceptions about anxiety do you encounter on a regular basis? Oh, that probably the first one that comes to mind is that stress and anxiety are the exact same things. Yes, we thought it was on our very first episode. Yeah, we used them interchangeably for what like the first mess. month. Well, in our, our lives. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, stress and anxiety, like I said earlier, they're similar, but they're really distinct concepts. Stress is that natural response. Anxiety involves excessive, often irrational worries uh, about current or future events. And so they are very, very different. Um, something else, too, that comes up quite a bit is that anxiety is just normal worrying and everybody experiences it. No. <laughs> anxiety anxiety is not something that we all just deal with. It's true that everybody experiences worries from time to time. That's okay. normal. But when you start to overanalyze constantly, you are constantly concerned about kind of the day-to-day -day functions. Yeah. And when you start, when those responses start to interfere with your daily functions, your conversations, work, relationships, it really is much, much deeper. And you're actually not just worrying about, you know, a, passing a grade or you're not worried about getting that promotion at work. When you're really just constantly worried about something every single day, almost every moment of every single day, that's yeah, when you have those deeper concerns. So something that I hear from people quite often is anxiety is not real. It's like you said, it's everybody's got their own stuff. And it's, yeah, everybody does. But everybody deals with it differently. You could, somebody with my same upbringing could deal with anxiety. They might not even have anxiety, right? But it was my experience and the way that my brain was formed and my survival instincts kicked in, which made it my anxiety. I think a lot of people have a hard time accepting it. 
Yeah. You seemed so happy. You can't actually have anxiety. And it's like, you guys, like, you don't know what people with actual anxiety are. They're fighting for their lives almost every single day, but still able to be happy and part of society and have a job and all of that. We don't always know that somebody has it. And it's, I think that's an, a big misconception too. Well, you seem happy, so you can't actually have anxiety. Mm -hmm. Or, or that if you just ignore it, it's just eventually going to go away on its own. It's just Surprise. a normal part of life. You're fine. Yes. It's mm -hmm. not a big deal. Think Drink about all. Of yeah, exactly. Yeah. You start to develop those lovely coping mechanisms. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But I think the biggest thing though, too, is that, you know, a lot of people that tend to experience stress or anxiety, they're already in their head. And so the fact that you have someone telling them, oh, well, you know, so-and-so person is going through way worse than you are. Mm -hmm. Well, that doesn't help. <laughs> that no. makes me just feel more bad about now myself. I'm guilty. Now I'm guilty about my anxiety. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. There's that shame spiral that constantly is kind of overplaying in, in, in anxiety ridden head. Probably the last thing, though, I wanted to mention, though, too, was something that tends to come up a lot is that only traumatic events can cause someone to have anxiety. Yes. Uh -huh. Yes. I read this in that book, Anxiety Rx. Hit it, Sable. Yeah, give it to us. <laughs> so traumatic events can contribute to anxiety, but anxiety disorders can result from a lot of different things. You mentioned earlier, it's about how you grew up. It's about how you responded to certain events that may seem like they were normal or uh, part of growing up, but it can include genetics, brain chemistry, your own personality. It can include all, all of those different things. So some individuals may develop anxiety disorders, but some may not. So it really doesn't matter if you've been through a traumatic event or you're just going through a really hard time. You can develop anxiety regardless of the situation. So that actually leads me, I was about to ask a question that's not on the outline, but you oh, just led boy. up to it perfectly, which is if stress is just the normal response to day-to-day -day life, but anxiety is where it becomes a disorder and all that. And if there's genetics at play and chemistry, is there, act is there, you got it, you can do it. Can you not have anxiety anymore or once you develop an anxiety disorder do you just have to learn how to cope with it mm -hmm. is that a good is that does that question make sense it does so question. essentially can you heal overcome it. yeah heal yeah. it over, or at least overcome your anxiety disorder if you can develop it can you undevelop it you can you actually I'll can absolutely if really? There, yes, you can. You, you really not. can. It's not something that is going to be lifelong or persistent for a lot of people. It could be just situational. That's why you have people with like adjustment disorders, but they have anxious features. So it may not necessarily develop into something that is uh, chronic or a chronic condition. You may start to learn how those healthy coping mechanisms. It's almost like, you know, when you talk to someone who's been through like a substance use disorder and they they have been clean and sober for 30 years, but then maybe something happens and they're triggered and then they go back to it. That can absolutely happen. Okay. So while clinically you may not meet the definition, because you got to think about too, we're looking at the DSM, which is what all counselors use to define certain disorders. If you aren't experiencing any of the qualifiers that make you have a anxiety disorder you technically don't have a anxiety disorder anymore you have just previously had it now it's not something that can completely be washed away because you constantly have to make sure that you're not going to be triggered you're not going to go back to that place you're going to have those coping coping mechanisms in place those healthy coping mechanisms in place to overcome those sensations or overcome that stress so again, that stress doesn't lead back to that anxiety. So there's absolutely ways that you can overcome your anxiety. And some people do and some people don't. But either way, there's no shame in either one. Yeah, for sure. So it is like an alcoholic. They are in recovery. They are sober. They are no longer considered an alcoholic. But they I thought they were always considered an alcoholic, just a recovered alcoholic. 
I just want to make the make sure we say that correctly, if that's true. Is that true? As so, someone who's recovered. So they, previ they previously had a substance use disorder. Yes. That's how clinically I would say it. Previous. Got it. Yeah. Okay. But they have to be careful of their triggers still. So that is how it would be for somebody with anxiety. You can handle it. You can do the coping mechanisms, therapies, all of that. But you still have to be mindful of triggers. But I think the goal there is to be able to head those triggers off. You are triggered, but I've got the tools in my tool belt to not go down that path. Absolutely. That's the yeah. Whole, yeah. What a exactly. beautiful thing to learn on this episode. Yeah, I just thought like... Thanks, Sable. We'll talk to you another time. Yeah, see you later. That's all we needed. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> okay, that was a good question. Thanks. Thank I'm you. known for my question. Yeah. yeah. Uh, is there anything else that you actually wanted to say about that before we get back to the no, okay <laughs> okay so the next we're going to talk about therapies and treatments so we can actually probably just keep going down that path but what are some common therapeutic approaches to managing a lot of our questions are stress and anxiety related if you feel the need to break that down obviously just yeah do that but yeah what are the common therapeutic approaches to managing those things so with both stress and anxiety Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, or CBT, so... CBT, not CBD. <laughs> CBT Cat, for therapy. Cat boy toy. <laughs> Cat boy toy, got it. <laughs> so CBT is probably the most widely used therapeutic approach, and it involves identifying and changing your negative thought patterns and behaviors. So it's really helpful for individuals to develop those healthier ways of thinking about yourself and coping. One of the things that you might see CBT applied is like journaling. Okay. Journaling is one of the ways you may see a therapist want you to practice CBT concepts because you're trying to understand your triggers. You're trying to understand your negative thought patterns. And sometimes in a moment where you are really stressed or you are experiencing those ruminations of thought. So you're constantly thinking about the same thing over and over again, which is a symptom of anxiety. You might want to write it all down, walk away for a minute, and then come back and read those things. Chances are you will start to see something called cognitive distortions, where you'll see, oh, I called myself this terrible name. That's yeah. not me at all. <laughs> Yeah. Why, why am I calling myself that? Why am I so down on myself? I'm amazing. You know what I just did in the last five minutes? I cleaned my house. I fed my kids. I went yeah. to work somehow all in five minutes. Yeah. How am I talking totally bad about myself? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you, you see how those types of things can really impact the perception that you have about yourself. Mm -hmm. And you start to develop better ways of thinking about yourself and coping with some of those kind of anxious moments or those stress-ridden moments. So like self-talk, I know um, there are a lot of times where I don't even realize the self-talk that I've got going on up here. <laughs> and if I were to take a moment to write it down and actually have to read it, I'd be like, why did you say that? You know what I mean? There's, I, and I like that approach because we're not even conscious of what's floating around up here. We're not. So making yourself put it on paper and realizing how ridiculous it is, I dig it. I like yeah. that. Yeah, I like that yeah, too. You're, yeah, you're literally confronted with the things that you say to yourself in your head. Yeah, yeah. And something, something that I do quite a bit in therapy, and a lot of therapists do this, is we ask people to think about a friend of theirs or a family member that they really love and care about, what would you say to that person that is going through that event, that same event that you went through? How would you talk to them? That's probably the same way that you should talk to yourself. You're not telling yourself, oh, well, get over it. You'll get over this. It's going to be fine. Calm down. Calm down is a big one. Don't tell yourself to calm down because you never calm down. Don't ever <laughs> tell me to calm down. I never had them. I never had <laughs> Good. That's what makes a healthy marriage. That's perfect. Right. <laughs> Other fighting words. Which, by the way, she tells me to calm down whenever I'm just looking for a sock. Uh, um, uh, so, if do I understand CBT appropriately? If it's just basically learning how to observe your own thoughts and behaviors, 
so that you can recognize your own patterns? Is that the idea behind cognitive behavior therapy? You put it perfectly. Absolutely. That is the best way to put it in a nutshell. So if you could compare therapy to, or actually, let me scratch that question. How does therapy help in ways that self-help and advice from non-professionals can't help? Yes. Oh, well, let me preface this by saying I think it is every therapist's dream for the stigma regarding mental health to go away completely. While there are people in the self-help sphere or non-professionals, you know, mental health advocates online that support mental health advocates and call themselves mental health advocates, they are really missing the need for expertise language. They're missing the way that a therapist can clinically assess and diagnose someone. Well, that's um, us. We're missing it. And that's why we are so glad you're here. Go ahead. Sorry. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> a lot of times also, of course, therapists use those evidence-based therapies. So I mentioned cognitive behavioral therapy. We use other things. We use mindfulness-based practices for stress and anxiety. Somatic things where you pay attention to your body and pay attention to your breath and those types of things. We are trained in those types of interventions. We're also proven, it, we, we use those evidence-based practices because they're proven to help patients in similar circumstances as you. So someone that is a non-professional may not have the experience of working with multiple different types of people and understanding the types of therapies or modalities that might work best for them. There, I did want to mention there was a really interesting article on CNN that talked about this, you know, use of catchy names, cutesy names for mental health. Yeah. One of them was called, this woman said that she needed to go on a grippy sock vacation. Oh, I think I get the reference. I don't love that. Yeah, I don't love it. As a therapist, I don't love it. For anybody who doesn't understand that, those grippy socks that you use in the hospital or what you would typically get when you're admitted to a psychiatric hospital. Yeah. Um, that's what she was referring to. So why do you say it was- far from a vacation. Yeah. Very different from a vacation. Lady, let's find her. Get her on the show. <laughs> <laughs> it would be interesting. It definitely would be interesting because yeah. I mean, the, she's not the only person who does that. You see that on TikTok or on Instagram or other places where- we naturally have such a short amount of time to give a lot of information. And so we're a very sound, bitey culture. Oh. So, yeah. So you might hear things like stressy, depressy, which is short for stressed and depressed. Somebody else says, <laughs> I'm having a minty bee. Yes, so, minty bee. I've heard yeah. That. Like a breakdown. <laughs> a mental, yeah, a mental breakdown. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then you might hear somebody else say, suey, that's short for suicidal. Oh my so, God. yeah. And so you see that a lot in the, like the younger TikTok generation and yeah. even some people, too, that want to kind of get in with that crowd, too. Yeah. The thing is, like using that terminology, while it's nice that the language is kind of being put out there and we're trying to reduce the stigma, we don't know exactly how this is going to impact the seriousness that people take mental health disorders. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah. important to not maybe use some of those words. If you don't understand a word, there's a whole plethora of web supported actual factual information that you can yeah. get out there that tells you the definition of some of those words, tells you what it is. Or honestly, you can go to a therapist and they will be able to not only diagnose you, but also provide you with the tools that you need in order yeah. to help you through whatever you're going through, especially with anxiety. Yeah, for sure. I think, you know, what I feel like needs to happen the most with mental health is to take the shame out of it. There's so much shame and guilt for the person experiencing it that it makes it a million times worse, but also works against you in getting help and being able to talk about it. So it's like these words minty b and what did you say suey Let, yeah. let's not do any of that let's just take the shame and the guilt out of it yeah i think i'm a little bit i'm definitely not conflicted because i see where that's a problem there's certain things that do there's a certain amount of reverence that needs to be involved yeah. but i also feel like humor is very much like a 
relief valve for people. 100%. So it's like, where do you draw that line of obviously not making light of suicide and stuff like that. I'm actually guilty of that, making jokes like that in the past, but that's a tricky, if, if there's like Gen X or Gen Y or millennials or whoever it is, uh, it's like making light of it to make it more accessible. It's just tricky. Like I get why it's a bad it's, thing, but I'm trying to think of like how it, um, the proper way to do that. You know, what I, mean? I think it's just talking about your experiences yeah, and not trying to give it like a cutesy name. Would you say not normalizing it, but I think every therapist is kind of confused or conflicted on yeah. what to do about this, because on the one hand, we're talking about mental health more than we ever have in the last like hundred years probably yeah so this time especially after the pandemic it's such a special time but it's also a special time for us to really cultivate the language cultivate <clears throat> the responsibility that comes with not only talking about mental health in your own personal mental health story but then also ways that we can better support other people so humor i 100 percent agree with you donnie there's so much to be said about having a humorous perspective on what you're going through because if we if we take ourselves too seriously then right. what's the point of life right mm -hmm. we could so, do it why yeah, ex exactly i know you both could <laughs> <laughs> which is a beautiful thing we it's turned to dust because <laughs> yeah. humor has to be a part of life it's yeah. just really finding that balance between the language that you use with friends and the occasional language that you might pepper into a story, but leaving the, the impression that people need to leave with any of that is that it's important to take care of your mental health. This is what I went through. I can look back on it now because I'm in a different place in my life, mm -hmm. but here are some resources. Here's some support for you. I've been where you've been. Like there needs to be that solidification at the end of, of that talk, regardless of the type of language that you use. So I know we kind of already found out that one big success story would be not having anxiety anymore. But do you have any success stories that you could share where therapy significantly helps someone with stress or anxiety? Yeah. So stress and anxiety is often, let me preface this by saying, it's really personal to the things that we were just talking about a lot of your past and a lot of your history and the way you grew up. I have a black female client who experienced a lot of bullying in middle school and in high school and even through college. She was often the only black female in her school and she is considered a larger size. And that caused a lot of microaggressions and frankly, like just straight up aggression. And unfortunately that followed her into her adulthood. And so she started going into a shell Mm -hmm. not depending on social interactions to fuel her. Yeah. And that really started causing her to not really have a lot of strong adult relationships. She doesn't engage with people socially outside of work. She has that fear of judgment because of what she experienced in school. She hasn't dated anyone since high school and she's almost 30 years old now. Yeah. yeah. So she started to have, she did have a few friends, but she didn't really keep up with them because again, she had that negative self-talk saying, Oh, they don't care about me that much. Oh, they have their own lives. They have their own boyfriends. They have their own children now. So I'm just going to live my life and do what I need to do to protect myself, essentially. Yeah. So I started seeing her and we started talking more about her history and her past trauma, essentially. That's really what yeah. it was. It was trauma and how it really dictated the way that she would just be let down by other people. She didn't want to put herself in any position where she's let down by people. And so that's when we started to talk more about the connection between her anxiety and her self-esteem. You guys may have heard this term about doing some inner child work. Let um, me tell you, I just made a post on LinkedIn today about some inner child stuff. I dealt with some inner child stuff a few weeks ago, and it has had a profound effect. Go ahead. Powerful. I'm into it. it. It is powerful. So yeah. I started doing some inner child work with her where we started talking to her younger self, giving her that love and support that she didn't have, asking her, what would you say to your 13-year-old self? What would you say to your 18-year-old self? And so she had some, some really great breakthroughs. And so we did some cognitive behavioral therapy work and started, she started journaling and writing down times when she would ruminate on things. 
she started doing that for about a month. And that's when she started to notice how negatively she talked about herself. Yeah. I mean, she graduated top of her class. She's a really good friend. Like she is at the top of her game at work, but she Mm -hmm. still felt so bad about herself. And then when she realized what she actually thought about herself and wrote it down on paper and again was confronted with what she was actually talking to herself about, that was a game changer for her. So she started realizing, you know what? I am not that person. Those experiences, yes, they were a part of who I was, but that's not who I am now. They have informed me making some decisions that I'm not happy with myself about, but that doesn't make me a bad person. That doesn't make me any less of a friend, lover, coworker, anything. So yeah, she she actually started to get more social with people too, because I encouraged her to reach out to that small group of friends that she had. Yes. So she was planning on spending her birthday alone. Like she was perfectly happy spending her birthday completely by herself. And so I was like, well, what would happen? What's pros and cons of reaching out to at least one friend? She said, of course, the worst con that you can think of, like they don't answer the phone and they look at it and they think that I'm just a terrible person. And why would I answer the phone for this girl? Of and in the best case scenario was that they answer the phone and they want to see her and they're excited it's her birthday. They remembered her birthday. Yeah. And of course, that best case scenario happened with her. Yeah, it did. And in fact, that friend decided to take it upon herself to invite their other circle of friends to her birthday. I love it for this gal. Yeah. And so she actually had a really nice day. And I was like, well, what would have happened if you just spent the day alone? She's like, yeah, I would have went to the museum. And that's probably about it. Yeah. <laughs> so it sounds like with that inner child work, which I could go off on this, we could do a whole episode on that. Absolutely. She realized she's worthy of love, not only from herself, but others. I think that's a big key, realizing that you yourself are worthy of love. And through journaling and all of that, she didn't feel the love growing up, right? That's Those experiences she went through. But realizing that I'm worthy of it just because I didn't feel like I was experiencing that or experiencing that from others. They cannot take that away from you. Yeah. You are worthy of love no matter who you are. So yeah, jot a- that down if you're listening. <laughs> <laughs> I love you are that. worthy of love. You are definitely worthy of love. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. And I really feel like, especially as a kid, it really only takes a couple of times of not getting love when you either need it or want it to... Just decide, okay, yep. like I'm not going to get what I need from people yeah. or I'm not worthy of it or whatever the case may be. I'm not crying. I just need to clear my throat. But oh, yeah, I feel true. like it's so easy as a kid to just, that is that becomes your framework for the way the world is going to be. Like, I'm not going to get what I need from people. So I'm just going to speak very meanly to myself and go day to day. Yeah. Well, and adding to that, the other isolation that she was feeling, being minority and maybe not looking like everybody else, mm-hmm. that's a very lonely spot. Yep. It is. So and it's to really go, relatable, too. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. That makes me so happy. I hope the rest of her birthdays just keep getting bigger. I know. Me, too. She's, she's a say. really wonderful person, and I'm so happy that she is able and willing and open to do the work because that's often the hardest part of everything is just wanting to do the work and actually asking for that help so she's she's fantastic well i love that awesome i love it good that's a good one yeah so what are some immediate strategies that someone could use to manage a moment of acute stress or anxiety i feel like journaling in the moment like when you're feeling the height of stress you should journal (laughs) <laughs> journaling is one thing that can help some people but usually before they start to punch things you want to try and encourage people or you want if you yourself are going through that heightened moment of stress or you're ruminating on something you want to just breathe really try and focus on your breathing breathing often gets really erratic when you're in a really high stress situation and it's directly connected to all of the other things that can throw you out of whack, right? So your, your heartbeat, your focus, your actual eye focus can kind of get out of whack. Maybe you even start to have a panic attack. So the very first thing you need to try and do is just breathe. So that could look like doing basic breaths where you breathe in for four seconds 
and then breathe out for six seconds and let oh. that breath just let, let it be a little longer than the way that you breathed in. So really allowing yourself to do that. If you're someone who likes to do some fancy breathing, or I call it bougie breathing. I don't know oh, why. yes. It's cute. <laughs> I want to do it. <laughs> it, makes, it gives a little, you know, Chanel stamp on it. Like, yeah, you know, there's something exclusive. So you want to do something called like a box breath. Yeah. Where I, you. I love box breath. So, so, yeah. So you imagine that it's a box. One side of the box is the breath. You breathe in. Other side of the box is you breathe. You hold it for a second at that corner for four seconds. And then you breathe out for four seconds. Hold. Breathe in for four seconds. Breathe out for four seconds. It's really, it's a really wonderful. You can easily just look it up. Box breath is super easy to do. Now, there's also something called a five finger breath, and that's for anyone who really enjoys more like a tangible type of a way to see their anxiety or see their stress melting away. And so you really just hold your hand out in front of you, and you use the use your fingers to trace up and down and use that to mimic your breathing in and breathing out. So you go up and down, breathe in, breathe out. So that's a really good one too. Yeah. Yeah. It it really brings a sense of calmness because if you don't have anybody there with you to help hold you or something like that too, or you just don't want to be held, which is perfectly fine in a moment of stress, you can really self-soothe yourself with that too. It's really great. Explain Another, that because five finger breath sounded like what I gave that seat. I mean, you like five finger <laughs> breath. So the, the description was needed for sure. Yeah, <laughs> it's pretty close. It's pretty close, but no, this was a little bit more calming, a little bit more, like I said, more that bougie breath. But I really love that one, even for myself. And there's also something called alternate nostril breathing that works really well for people where you hold one nostril as you breathe in and then you switch and hold the other nostril and then breathe out using the, the nostril that was just closed. Again, it's so hard to describe. It's so he's hard. One, he's only got one good nostril. He my, do it. my septums are not created oh, equal. No. Well, yeah, if you, then that's not the breath for you. You can use yeah. the fox breath or the five finger yeah. breath. Something too that's really helpful for people is to use the three, two, one method. That's a really great grounding exercise to get you out of your head. So yes. it involves the five senses and identifying five things you can see. I've heard of this. Four things you can touch, three things you can hear, two things you can smell, and one thing you can taste. Now, hold on, though, because I know nobody is going to remember which order to do it in. <laughs> no, I'm lost already. <laughs> and that's okay. You just have to remember the five senses. Okay. I will tell you, though, it's better to leave taste for last. Yeah. Because rarely do you taste more than one thing. I don't right. know how your taste buds Pork work. Yeah, I'm just running out <laughs> of the kitchen to get my five. <laughs> <laughs> Started on the wrong no. one. <laughs> but I'll repeat it. It's five things you can see, four things you can touch, three things you can hear, two things you can smell, and one thing you can taste. That makes sense. That yeah. order makes sense. Yeah. Five things you can see. Four things you can touch. Three things you can hear. Hear. Either way. Two things you can smell. Because smelling three things would send me into a fit. Two things you can smell. One thing you can taste. Perfect. Yeah, that's perfect. Right. And then, yeah, the last thing I'll mention, though, too, is I, I mentioned this before, but really allowing yourself to feel that physical embodiment of your stress or your anxiety in a safe way. So really, sometimes you just need to like shake your body and move your body. Yeah. So whether that be putting on a song and dancing until you're really just completely out of breath, then you can do the yeah. breathing. Yeah. Or you can really just start to move your body, shake your arms, stomp up and down, really get yeah. it all out. But then taking a minute to, when, whenever you get out of breath, because yeah. for me, I'll get out of breath pretty quick. Yeah. Take a minute and actually just start to self-soothe, start to slow down. Maybe you allow your arms to shift in front of your body. You kind of twist a little bit and let yeah. them hang low. Maybe you even start to tap your chest. Like you cross your arms across your chest and you just... 
tap your chest. Is that um, like a somatic movement? Mm -hmm. Would those things be? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You start to roll your neck from side to side slowly, not too fast. <laughs> right. Uh, Waving it around. <laughs> yeah, don't do it too fast. And then just allowing yourself to take a minute, feel the feelings in your body, feel your heartbeat, feel the way that, you know, your anxiety might be showing up still, maybe allowing your breath, whether it be bougie breath or normal breath, allowing your breath to kind of focus in on those areas. So for some people, it really is a full body experience and they need to get it out. And that really helps for some people. It definitely does. I So that book I was reading, Anxiety Rx, he mentions identifying the feelings mm -hmm. because the feelings are what makes your brain think, oh gosh, we've got to come up with something because we're feeling anxious, right? So being able to ward off these alarms, right, by moving or identifying them and shifting that focus will help your brain get onto Absolutely. something else or get back to whatever you were doing. Yeah, I definitely like it. So one thing historically we touch on a lot is like the importance of physical activity and lifestyle. Is that something that you get into with your clients on this topic at all, or do you pretty oh, much yeah. leave it all? Oh, yeah. They're all connected, honestly. Yeah. The way that we eat, sleep, move our bodies, it really is going to dictate how we manage stress and anxiety. Like it's, it's vital. If you don't have a lot of routine in your life in those areas, yeah. Everything else is just going to be out of whack. I, I mean, feel even, like, go ahead. well, no, I want you to go ahead. Because <laughs> yours is like real stuff. Mine is just, <laughs> it's okay. Jump in when you want. That's okay. Um, <laughs> but I was about to say for diet. Mm -hmm. So if you think about the way that food dictates our mood, that alone can shift the way that your stress and anxiety is going to show up. Because you're not only thinking about what's in your tummy, you're thinking about the contents of the food. So your blood sugar regulation is going to play a crucial role in you being hangry or not being satiated enough and to deal with those stressful situations. And also like caffeine and sugar intake, same thing. You're going to have disrupted sleep. It can actually increase anxiety. There's a lot of studies that show that people that are uh, addicted to caffeine and sugar probably have an anxiety disorder um and also the fact that you are That's us with the cast yeah yep. <laughs> playing exactly. ourselves i i know i'm singing to the choir i know yeah <laughs> but also wanted to mention though too the fact that if you exercise that's going to help eventually with your sleep it's going to raise those feel good chemicals in your body so endorphins it can reduce those levels of the stress hormones, such as cortisol, which, by the way, if someone has a stress or anxiety disorder, please get your cortisol levels checked. Um, that's a really crucial thing that can impact the rest of your, your healing throughout anxiety is your cortisol levels. Um, I will say this about cortisol. What, I don't you know. You said it really official just then. Like no, you're about it to is, drop it. I am about to drop something. <clears throat> So historically, the first thing I do when I wake up in the morning and the reason I wake up in the mornings is to have a cup of coffee. My favorite thing about waking up other than seeing my family, um, but really it's the coffee. I'm so excited about having coffee in the morning. Usually excited the night before. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Oh, even better. So <laughs> I have been very stressed with the holidays coming up. I was going through a lot of things. Um just there was a lot going on and I was really feeling the physical effects of my cortisol, caffeine, anxiety, stress. So what I started making myself do in the mornings is eating first, which I don't love to do, like just some yogurt, whatever, eat that first, have some water. Then I've been having coffee. And would you say, and if I'm wrong, you can tell me here, mm -hmm. I have been much more delightful. In yep. the mornings, especially not hitting my already revved up system with gasoline. So, yeah, two observations. Yes, definitely made a big improvement. But I've also noticed you already gone back to starting with coffee. Yeah, this week I've been, I fell off the wagon. It happened. It, Don't and I've just been hitting it. 
coffee after coffee till like 11 a.m. Yeah. And I'm telling myself, Steph, what are you doing? I'm self-sabotaging right you now. You are. You are. At least you're aware of it, though. That's the thing. Because some people don't even really want to be confronted with it or yeah. are aware of it. So Super at least aware. you know it. I did it Monday and I've done it every day since. What's today? Tomorrow starts a new day. Today's, Today's Wednesday. Wednesday. <laughs> so you're three days deep back on the caffeine train. Yeah. Still Plain. time to change it. Still time. Yeah. Tomorrow. Tomorrow I'm going to wake up and force feed myself some yogurt yeah. and then I'm going to have coffee. Beautiful. I promise. I'm promising the two of you here right now. And everyone okay. listening. We will hold you to it. You know I'm going to email you, right? Email me. <laughs> and hold me accountable you because <laughs> it's so hard, though. Like I know. It is. I know. I don't want to wake up and just shove yogurt down my throat or eggs or something. But it's good for you. It's good for your... It just makes me feel better throughout the day. And I have been pretty useless the last three days. And that's probably why. Yeah, that might be. It might be connected for sure. That's why exercising early in the morning works well for most people because their cortisol is already high. Uh -huh. And so you can get a little bit of a, a jolt from, from that cortisol. Then obviously the cortisol is going to go down the more you get tired after working out. So yeah, so obviously having coffee first thing in the morning is not always good for people with with anxiety yeah well it's like putting jet fuel on ikea you know what i mean what if things ah. all right i i had to share that bit, bit with you guys because i think a lot of people just wake up and have coffee yeah that's true yeah i think most people do yeah i mean maybe i'm way off base on that but we yeah, sure do maybe we just do yeah anyway no a lot okay. of people do back to the yeah back to the real stuff. enough about step <laughs> yeah enough about my morning <laughs> habits are there any resources or tools that you would recommend to our listeners? Absolutely. So the first one that comes to mind, want to preface this by saying, of course, that not everybody that experiences anxiety is going to have a, another mental health condition, but that does, if you have one mental health condition, you may end up with others such as depression, bipolar disorder, you may have schizophrenia, other things. But I really want to make sure that people understand that if they themselves are going through a really stressful time and they're having thoughts about suicide, that there is help for them. So the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, which is 988, right. it is no longer that really long number that was in that song. You don't have to remember all that. It is just 988. It's for calling or texting. They even have a chat feature. It's English and in Spanish. It's really great for anyone who's personally in a crisis or for anyone that is seeking help on behalf of someone else that's going through suicidal thoughts or is in a crisis. Okay. So I always have to mention that one. Yes. For therapy, of course, going to plug us, Ellie Mental Health. 100%. Always have, to, always have to plug us and what we do and, and why I'm so passionate about what we do. We offer insurance uh, or we accept insurance and we also accept self-pay clients elementalhealth.com. We're in the Tanglewood office. I am the clinic director there. If you don't want to go necessarily with elemental health specifically, and you just want to look at all your options in your area, Psychology Today is a fantastic resource for finding therapists in your area. It will tell you specifically what their passions are, if they do or don't accept insurance. You even get to see, I love they've updated the website where you can actually get little snippets of what they sound like, what their personality looks like. Oh, I so you like really that. Get, yeah. And the great thing is most of them do offer like a free 15 minute consultation. So you don't have to immediately give all your information away to them and start seeing them right away. You can actually see if you're a good fit with each other. So it might be over the phone. It might be over Zoom or some other secure platform. But Psychology Today is a fantastic resource. I um, also want to mention some mindfulness and meditation apps for those times when you're feeling really stressed. Headspace is fantastic. They have a lot of really free guided meditations for stress reduction, sleep improvement, just overall mindfulness. And then, of course, Calm is another really great one. Same thing, meditations, sleep stories, because I don't know about y'all, it is really hard for me to go sleep. Sometimes I have to just turn on something, not turn on the TV. Actually yes. turn on something just to listen to and calm, calm my nervous system down a little bit to relax. Yeah. It's just so fantastic. Um, I, um, 
I was really stressed a couple of years ago and I like doing puzzles, right? So my sweet guy here got me a puzzle that helped with my stress. And I would turn on Calm and I listened to the, I think it's LeBron James series. I loved it. And there's actually puzzles that like Calm, calm is puzzles. somehow part of it. But I'm telling you, you guys got to look up LeBron James on Calm. It was good. I really liked it. You listened to it a couple times, didn't you? Yeah, I did. Sorry. I cut nice. You. Yeah, I loved it. There's some good stuff on Calm. Yeah, yeah. And if you, yeah, if you, if you want to hear some of your favorite celebrities and they have those nice, calm, soothing voices or surprising LeBron James typically yeah. wouldn't have a song, calm, soothing voice. Yeah. But the way that they present it and the way that they incorporate music and just, it's the whole thing. It's mm -hmm. so fantastic. I know we've mentioned like journaling a few times. There's a few really good journaling apps. I've used a couple, but there's plenty out there. You can just search in in whatever app store that is on your phone, but there's something called Day One. Okay. It's a journaling app that allows users to reflect on their thoughts and experiences and just sometimes it'll actually give you prompts as well. Oh, nice. That's yeah. the hard part, knowing where to start. Mm -hmm. That's that's a tricky, tricky thing to do. Yeah. There's plenty of websites too that offer prompts as well. But if you want an actual app, they offer prompts too. Day One. And then... Mm -hmm. And then Journey, that is also another journaling app. And it also has photo and video integration. So if you want to take pictures of something or if you want to take a video of yourself, that is something that I've actually started incorporating with some of my clients is actually having them record themselves in a moment of stress and having them watch it back. Because sometimes you're like, of course, Everybody hates the sound of their own voice. Yes. That's just kind of a given. Trust me. I got to do this every week, edit these <laughs> podcasts, and I tell myself to shut up every week. So you're not alone. Everybody yeah. does not like it. Yeah. But if you really sit down and watch yourself, your heart kind of goes out to yourself in that state that you're in at that moment. So it's a really, really good way to, to again, track your, your feelings, your thoughts, and actually hold you accountable for some of those things. And also get you in the mood of maybe switching your thought patterns and maybe you aren't as awful as you think you are and you want to give your, yourself again that self-love. There's also some mood tracking apps too. So if you don't really feel like journaling yet, maybe you just want to track those triggers and, and thought patterns. There's several mood tracking apps. A couple that clients have mentioned to me before is Dalio, D-A-Y-L-I-O. Okay. So it really tracks your mood and allows you to register your emotions and what activities you had. And same thing with e-moods, E-M-O-O-D-S, e-moods. And that's specifically designed for people with mood disorders. Again, it can track your emotions, your sleep, your medications and how that may be impacting you. The foods that you eat, maybe your foods are connected, the foods that you eat are connected with your reactions to certain events. Both of those are really, really good apps as well. When we were wearing the whoop strap, mm -hmm. it would, every day, you would track your mood mm -hmm. and it would list things like, well, did you have this? Did you do this? Did, 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 did. So that was, I never really did it. I should have probably done it, but. It started to feel like a job. I get the idea behind that, being able to identify. Quantifying your, yeah. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. yeah. So it's all connected, right? Like I mentioned mm -hmm. earlier, it's, it's everything is connected to how we respond to stressful moments and to our anxiety disorders. Absolutely. Thank you. Those are, uh, those all sound like really awesome tools. Yeah. Uh, for sure. So this one's not on the outline, but it's something that just popped into my head. Sure. I feel like culturally we're becoming like more aware of and better educated on like neurodivergence as a whole. And when I say culturally, I mean myself, probably because I don't really keep up with what everybody else thinks or knows. But I also feel like every aspect of neurodivergence that I'm aware of seems to be really closely related to anxiety. I don't want you to go off on a whole new topic here, but do you have any thoughts on that or, or seen in your own practice? Yeah, I think there is a correlation between the two. But again, of course, not everybody with a neurodivergent, neurodivergent disorder, like autism spectrum disorders, 
they are not going to have anxiety. And obviously not everyone with anxiety is going to have an autism yeah. spectrum disorder. Yeah, They can be related though, because imagine you are living in a world where no one understands you, you feel different, you may act different, and people sometimes will call that out. Mm -hmm. It's only natural for someone to develop some sort of a stress or an actual anxiety disorder. So mm -hmm. it, 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 when you think about the, again, because we're talking about our life experiences and how they're correlated to whatever diagnosis that we have, they can be related and it understandably so. But again, it's definitely not something that they is always in. connected. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay. What role does medication play in the treatment of anxiety? So medication can be a really helpful partner to things such as talk therapy, somatic therapies, any other therapy. There's a lot of studies that show that they are better off together as opposed to just like medication on its own. Because if you think about it, the way in which we learn and process information, we're kind of developing new synapses or connections in our brain. Sometimes it's a little harder to make those connections depending on how long you've had certain conditions. Again, the types of medications that you're already on, the types of health conditions that you already have, it may be that you need a little boost in making those connections fire off a little faster. So medication, while it is wonderful, doesn't necessarily have to be a lifelong type of a intervention. So medication is a good part and it can be a crucial part for some people. But some people also find that talk therapy is great on its own. They can work through what they need to. But I always recommend for people who have tried talk therapy with multiple types of therapists, they may have something in them where it just, again, their brain is not really making those connections work. And that really is where medication can, again, provide that little boost that you may need to help your therapy work a little bit better. Fantastic. Great. Okay. What about... In your, in your experience, how has the public perception of stress and anxiety changed in years? We kind of talked about this a little bit already, but I think it's worth talking about a little bit more. For sure. I'll say, so back when I was a kid, it wasn't a thing. Back in 1985 through the 90s, it was not a thing. And I don't hold my parents responsible because... They didn't have any vocabulary. They didn't know, you know, you don't, nobody knew back then. I think even if you think about my, my mother was a nurse. My father is in the medical field. My sister's in the medical field. I don't think we ever talked about mental health or anything. And this is coming from someone who has had anxiety and had depression since they were like age probably 11. I was one of those statistics that you see about kids having depression early and earlier on. So we definitely still didn't talk about it, though. They knew something was going on with me, but definitely not something that we talked about. I think over the last, even like the last maybe 10, 15 years, we have seen such a beautiful, wonderful shift in not only understanding that, yes, people have mental health disorders. No, they don't all have to be quote unquote crazy in right. order to seek help or at least acknowledge the fact that they have something going on with them. But I think we're also recognizing too that in every culture, the stigma is different. So how do we cater to that particular culture? Like my passion is diversity, equity, and inclusion. That's what my whole dissertation's about and making yeah. sure that people understand that the more people that we have that are representative of different cultures in all of the spaces, mental health included, the better it is for our diverse patients. Because there's a lot of unfortunate stigmas when it comes to not only racial and ethnic groups, but also people with disabilities. You mentioned mm -hmm. neurodivergency. There's a huge stigma that there may be, that's, that's the only thing that's going on with them. Maybe there is something else going on with them besides their neurodivergence. You're also talking about people with different religions and other cultural backgrounds too. So we're starting to see this acceptance that yes, there may be a stigma in your culture, but come here and let me better support you. Let me give you the tools that you need that you can go back to your community 
to provide them with the support and love and care that they also need. Yeah. I, so I was raised very religious Christian background. I still Christian, all of that, but there's this huge stigma in this, in the Christian church that it's Jesus takes away all of your fears and anxieties. And that was another thing that played into my anxiety. Do I not love Jesus if I feel, if I'm feeling scared, if I'm feeling depressed? And none of that is true. None of that. Sometimes it is, yes, in theory, right? You should just be able to pray to God and feel better. But that is not how it works for a lot of people. And that's okay. That doesn't make you less of a Christian. That doesn't make you less of anything. At the end of the day, we are all human, no matter what our religion is our culture, none of that. We are all humans at the end of the day. And sometimes we just need a little bit of help and that's okay. That doesn't make us less than our culture or less than our religion. Mm -hmm. Like that stigma has got to be removed. Yeah, I think it it. it doesn't reflect negatively on your, the level of your faith or anything like that either. No. Yeah. But that is the one. Oh, for sure. For sure. My, my husband is a youth pastor And this is something that he and I have talked about ad nauseum because he really wants students to understand the importance of talking about their mental health, supporting their friends who are going through a mental health crisis or may kind of put out some some breadcrumbs, essentially, some lifelines to see where their friends are and in in their role in helping them through a possible crisis in the future. Mm -hmm. He does a really good job of asking me questions and wanting to bring other people in to share their expertise because it, like you mentioned, it's not, it's not just, it's not just one thing that can help someone. It has to be a community. Cause even if you think about just religious teachings, the community is, is impactful in shaping the, the perceptions of someone, the, the love that someone feels. This is just another form of the community, strictly focusing on supporting your mental health and making sure that you are mentally fit. Mm -hmm. That's all of it. Yeah. Awesome. So bring us home. What advice would you give to someone who's hesitant to seek therapy for their anxiety? You know what? It's completely understandable. And honestly, asking for help is a really hard challenge. It's a really, really hard thing to do. So the, the first thing I would have to do is just acknowledge how hard it is to even ask for help. A lot of us are not really, I think we're, we're, a, we're a bootstraps nation, right? Everybody pull themselves up by the bootstraps. We're going to be okay. But the thing is, you really have to normalize the fact that it's hard to ask for help for anyone, regardless of what they're going through, even at work at school, at church, in our own personal lives, it's really hard to ask other people for help. So we just have to normalize the experience of therapy though too, that going to therapy is not only a positive first step towards their own self-improvement, but I would also tell them how courageous it is to ask for that help and recognize that they have a lot of self-awareness already. Because like I, 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 I can't stress this enough, Going to therapy and actually asking for help truly is the hardest part of the process of therapy. Yes, you're going to cry. You're going to talk about some things that are uncomfortable, but that's what the therapist is there for. They are there to support you and guide you through that. They have seen and heard a lot of different things. I cannot tell y'all enough about how many different situations that I have been privileged to be a part of and a part of someone's growth. And that first step is often the really the hardest step. And I think too, sometimes a lot of people think that, you know, they can't go to someone because they're going to tell all their business, right? They're going to start talking about what they're going through. That's why it's also important to talk to a therapist because you have that safety net of confidentiality. There's only certain things that I have to report like legally. So if you're going to harm yourself, you're going to harm other people, there's reports of abuse. Those are the only things. Everything else that you talk about here, whether you cheated on a test in ninth grade and you still feel guilty about it, I'm not going to call your school. 
I'm not going to blast it on social media that I had a talk with somebody and they cheated at this school. I'm not going to do anything (laughs) like that. (laughs) Or like, speaking of cheating, like if I I once had someone disclose to me that they were cheating on their spouse while I encouraged them to seek help and support and maybe tell their spouse eventually, I'm not going to be the person to tell all their business. Your friend might tell all your business or at least tell other people about your business. (laughs) But that is not my role. I am going to protect. And that's part of building that therapeutic relationship because I already already recognize that it's really hard to even make this first step. Who am I to judge what you're going through? For sure. Awesome. Thanks, Doc. That was good. You're welcome. I think. Doc. (laughs) No, I just. I doc. am. I'm going to call him that from now on. It's a doc. Yeah, this was great. And I know you're busy. So thank you for carving time out for us to make sense of all of this. I'd love to have you back on if you will have us. Mm-hmm. You are just great. I love the way that you communicate and share things and make it not scary. So thank you for that. Absolutely. It's my pleasure. All right. Well. Yeah, that wraps it up. I don't have anything else left to say. Okay. Thank you so much. This is awesome. And I look forward to uh, doing this again. I do too. And thank you guys for all the work that you do. I think what you talk about here is incredibly important. It can be a really life-changing first step for a lot of people. So I'm so happy and proud that you're part of my team, my mental health advocate team. And yeah. I'm happy to support you guys in any way I can. Thanks so much. Thank you so Have much. Have a good one. Bye.